Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q. This video is a full review of the Messerschmitt BF 109 K 6 Kurfürst. Hello there, and here on the grass outside the holding hangar is the Messerschmitt BF 109 K 6, and this is a full review of the aircraft to supplement the reaction video that I did a few days ago. This was the last proposed variant of the Iconic series, intended to standardise production which had become diverse during the G variant, and also to mount heavy weaponry in addition to what was already on the aircraft, specifically an extra pair of 30mm cannons mounted on the wings as you can see here. The World of Warplanes team have honoured that and has made this a very hard-hitting aircraft. So what we'll do now is take a look at the numbers. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, you'll be missing a lot of very important information, but you can use a link below the video to skip ahead to another part of it. Here we are with the spreadsheet for all of the Tier 7 fighters, and there are rather a lot of them. 16, in fact, and I'm going to have to scroll across to show you them all. And there we go, just coming to the end now. Now, if you don't know how this spreadsheet works, there's a link below in the description to an instructional video that will tell you most of what you need to know, and then you can come back and watch this section. So let's go on to the uh, air characteristics of the aircraft. Some of you will have seen most of this previously in the reaction video, but it's worth stepping through again. So talking about the gun armament, we have a rating of 37 and a cumulative DPS of 638. And straight away we can see this is best in class. Um, across all of the tier 7 fighters. And here's something I didn't mention before, because I only checked it afterwards. That DPS there of 638 is actually higher than any tier 8 fighter. This is tier 9 DPS on a tier 7 aircraft. It is phenomenal. What we have? We have the familiar 30mm uh, uh, MK108 uh, cannon, which is hub mounted. We have the extra 30mm cannons, which are mounted on the wings. And we have the two 13mm machine guns, which synchronised and fire through the propeller. The cannons deliver 180 DPS each, so that's 3 times 180 with a rate of fire of 240 shells per minute. Range is slightly small, 180, uh, 1,890 feet. And then there are differences that begin occurring, which is unusual for weapons groups which are of identical guns. On the hub mounted cannon, we have an auto aim angle, the amount you can be off target by in the game will correct your aim for you, of 3 degrees, and a rather nice dispersion angle of 0.55. That's the way that the bullets spread out, or the shells spread out, from the muzzle of the cannon. This is quite tight for a cannon, and the overheat time is a fairly usable 6 seconds. Shell velocity, not that fast. You're going to have to give quite a lot of lead to air, uh, shooting things that are banking away from you at 1,020 feet per second. Now, on the wing-mounted guns, for once, the World of Warplanes team have seen fit to vary the characteristics, and we've only got an auto-aim angle of 2 degrees. So these are less accurate, or res less forgiving of you being off target, than the hub-mounted cannon. And the dispersion angle is rather greater as well, 0.65, which is not good for cannons. Overheat remains the same at six uh, seconds, and the shell velocity, for some reason, is somewhat slower as well. I don't think this is going to make a big difference when you're shooting at aircraft that are banking away from you. It's only about 50, 70 feet or so seconds, 70 feet per second uh, less than the uh, hub-mounted uh, cannon. Nevertheless, be aware of it. You may find that your DPS doesn't seem to be quite as good when you're um, shooting at something that's at long range and banking away from you. And then the two 13mm uh, uh, machine guns contribute 49 DPS each, rate of fire 700 bullets per, per uh, minute, range only 1640 feet, auto aim angle of 4, that is rather good um, for uh, machine guns, not to be sniffed at at all, dispersion angle is also 0.7 rather good for machine guns, overheat is a long 20 seconds of course being machine guns, and the shell velocity is identical to that of the hub mounted cannon, so you don't need to worry about two of your weapons groups missing when you're firing at banking aircraft. But this is a powerful aircraft. You could say it's the equivalent of the BF-109E at Tier 5, which has similarly powerful armament, although I would tend to suggest that this is even more the case for this aircraft than it is for that BF-109E. It's displaced the previous hardest-hitting aircraft, by some distance, as you can see, the Ki-84 Hayati used to be, with 470 cumulative DPS and a rating of 28, the hardest hitting aircraft in this comparison, and it's nowhere near the DPS of this K-6. 
it comes to the survivability, most fighters are fairly fragile. This is no exception. The rating is seven, which is in the middle. Hit points are 300. Again, somewhat in the middle. These are all compressed figures for the fighters. Damage resistance is okay at 46. Fire resistance, I'm pleased to say, is 60, which gives you plenty of scope to mount a first aid dressing pack kit, even if you choose to mount an uprated engine on this um, aircraft. And you might get away with not using the firefighter or fire resistance skills, even if you do that. Airspeed, it's similar to the Gustav, which is next to it. However, there is an effect coming from either the extra weight of those guns or the drag factor by the great air presented uh, going forward, or both. And the rating is 55, one point less than the Gustav. The cruise speed is a bit less at 282 miles an hour. Boost maximum speed, 441, again a bit less. Boost duration, nice nine seconds. The maximum dive speed, only 534. These are okay figures for... Um, a high energy fighter you'll be able to work with these but as you can see if you are uh, as i'll show you in a little bit later um it's the p51d mustang which would be the airframe which i think is probably most similar to this in this comparison barring the gus the g variant the gustav um has superior characteristics as you can see as i just highlight them there maneuverability and this is where things take a distinct turn um and um, for me, because I usually build my BF109s with what I might call a surprise maneuverability maneuverability build, uh, and I do surprise people with how agile my BF109s are. Of course, I still don't turn with Spitfires or Russian uh, Yak aircraft or Japanese turn fighters. I slash and burn those uh, and then run away. But other aircraft I outturn with these, particularly other high energy fighters with the maneuverability build, and that's what I employ on the BF109G Gustav. The manoeuvrability on the 109K-6 is I'll reduced by quite a degree. It's 1.4 seconds slower to turn 360 degrees at 11.7 seconds. The roll rate is the same at 130. Controllability is poor. This is the speed with which the aircraft responds to an instruction from a control surface to change direction. direction. And you'll see that there are some... Uh, aircraft which have got quite a uh, higher rating the Spitfires for instance the Yak-3T, the Yak-3RD, the Yak-3 and then also both of the Japanese fighters so that's even less reason to want to get into a turn fight scenario because basically your aircraft is not going to be as agile and quick to respond um, when you say please change direction Minimum optimum speed is 157. The maximum optimum speed is the same as the Gustav at 429, which means you've got a slightly reduced optimum range in which your characteristics for maneuverability, etc., do not degrade at 272 miles an hour. However, it's still pretty good. It's second best in class. So generally, the degradation of your maneuverability is not going to be an issue you're worrying about. It's just that you don't have a lot of it in the first place. And the stall speed, therefore, is also a bit higher at 106 miles an hour than... Uh, and that, that compares to the Gustav, which is only 93. So as we can see, this is quite a different aircraft airframe, even though to all intents and purposes it looks similar to the Gustav. In terms of maneuverability, it behaves quite differently. Altitude performance is pretty much the same as the Gustav and quite similar to the other high energy fighters. Um, at 62, the rating... The uh, optimum altitude is the same as the Gustav at 7,218 feet. Maximum service ceiling, just a little bit under 14,000 feet. The climb rate is slightly less than the Gustav at 462. Now, there are a couple of outliers here. Um, the Kostikov climbs very quickly because it has powerful jet engines that allow it to do so. So discounting that, we can see that... Um, the LA-9RD with its rocket boosters also climbs quickly, but every th everything else has not a tremendously uh, great advantage. Again, rocket boosted Yak-3RD does it as well. But if you look at the Mustang, which I think is the aircraft that you're likely to have to counter most often at Tier 7, let's not talk about Tier 8 yet, You've actually got slightly better climb rate, so you might be able to stand this on its tail. And if you've got boost and engine cooling available, you might be able to just about get a Mustang to stall out behind you. There aren't that many aircraft that can say they could do that. I've done it a couple of times to Mustangs that have started off in a worse configuration than me. 
Power to weight ratios are okay, but nothing special. The aircraft, in theory, will not accelerate quite as quickly as a Gustav. You'd expect that with those pods under the wings. They're going to present a drag feature. Um, if you want to do it in the American style of how many pounds would you remove to get a virtual horsepower back, it's 4.17 or thereabouts. Um, so as you can see, these figures are not uh, inclining, you to make th inclining you to think that the aircraft is going to be quick off the mark when you say go. Now the Gustav is the obvious aircraft to compare this to. And as you can see there, you've got much greater firepower, but at the cost of less maneuverability, quite a lot less, and a slight to worse performance in, in, and speed. But I want to draw your attention to the P-51D Mustang. I did this previously in the reaction video. I'm going to do it again. And discounting the firepower, which is, of course, very much in favour of the K-6, the figures that you can see for survivability and so on are fairly similar. Except that actually you look like you may be able to accelerate quicker than a P-51D Mustang. Another reason to climb away from it if it's a flying level and has to point its nose up and start uh, chasing you hard. And it's in theory got a bit more maneuverability. It's got very similar airspeed. Now, the reason I've shown you this is because I would not consider putting a maneuverability build on the P-51D Mustang, although perhaps I should try that. 64 is not too bad for a high energy fighter. And if I wouldn't consider putting a maneuverability on this plane, except as an experiment, I don't think I want to do it on the BF 109K6 either. I think this would be best built as a speed uh, with um, speed in mind. Now, later in the video, I will discuss what you can do if you're thinking about tier 8 aircraft. You're thinking perhaps the P61, which has got high maneuverability. Can you counter that? You're thinking about possibly the XP-54. Less of a threat these days. There are fewer of them around, I feel. But again, high manoeuvrability. I will show you what you can do if you try and crank up the manoeuvrability. But these figures, to me, strongly suggest that a speed build is the way to go. If we go into worst-in-class figures, well, the firepower is not worst-in-class, that's for sure. But you'll see some survivability red appearing. Well, I said the figures were compressed. You can see that this manoeuvrability is not great. Just pop in controllability there, uh, altitude performance, no red there, and power to weight ratios, no red there either. So my view on this aircraft looking at those figures is that for once, instead of doing the surprise maneuverability build on my 109s, which I have throughout um, the uh, tiers, all the way from the tier 4 to um, the Gustavia tier 7, this one I much prefer to build as a, a fast aircraft, increase the cruise speed, increase the uh, maximum speed under boost, and fly a little bit like a heavy rather than a true fighter. With that firepower, it will certainly feel like a heavy when you're shooting at bombers and, and heavies and ground attackers, I promise you. So, let's go and see how I've set the aircraft up. Here we are back with the BF109K-6. My aircraft is specialised, but when you first get this aircraft, this is what you'll be missing in terms of equipment and consumable slots. You'll be missing one off the airframe, and you'll be missing one of two on the engine in terms of equipment slots. This may cause you to build the aircraft slightly differently when it's stock. It's certainly not going to allow you to make it as fast as you possibly can, or indeed as manoeuvrable as you possibly can. You're just going to be relying on that heavy hitting uh, forward firing weaponry um, to get you out of trouble. As far as consumable cons uh, consumables are concerned, you'll be missing just one and that will be off the airframe. So no pneumatic control assist or other goodies that you might like to put into that particular slot. My aircraft, as I've mentioned, is specialised. Let's pop it back into specialist configuration and we'll see how I've built the plane. Now, given how I uh, described the aircraft within the aircraft statistics section that's just gone by, you won't be at all surprised to see this. Um, it's similar to the build that I demonstrated on my reaction build, but there is one difference. This time I have made sure that I've selected the bonus characteristics that I want and I have calibrated certainly the speed equipment up to the very highest level which means that I get all of the positive benefit and the smallest possible negative benefit. What you may not know is if you get up to around about 466 on this calibration, you'll get all of the positive benefits. You won't get any more after that, but you will, if you carry on calibrating, be able to reduce the negative um, effects slightly. So you can see it's 478 on the polished skin. And if I can hover over it and get it to appear, always a bit temperamental, this interface, 478 on the ultimate uprated engine. 
and as you can see same on the boost mixture injection system not sure whether I did it on the guns let's just check I did it on the guns as well so let's start there unsurprisingly I've gone for accuracy on the guns you want as many of those 30 millimeter shells landing as possible at one time so we've got it fully calibrated for 21 percent extra accuracy and fortunately that gives us 17 percent uh, pilot's resistance to injury um, adverse effect which means that you might be using that uh, first aid kit more often bonus characteristics I've improved the accuracy when moving firing moving targets which I think means that you can be off target by a little bit more and the game will correct your aim for you we'll see the effect of that in the post build effects section that's coming up a little bit later because the pilot is at such risk, great, much greater risk of getting injured, I've gone for the 5% pilot's resistance to injuries, and I've gone for 3% outright accuracy, which will narrow the way that the bullets spread out as they leave the muzzle of the uh, machine guns and the uh, cannons. Other bonus characteristics, well, as I say, these are definitely the three that I would go for, and for such high DPS guns, I wouldn't go for the in chance, increasing the chances of inflicting critical damage or causing fire. That's not my philosophy. With high hitting guns, I like to improve the accuracy. With guns that are, uh, do have relatively low DPS, I then try and maximize the number of criticals and fires that they will cause. On the pure speed build then, I've mounted a piece of experimental equipment because I had it. And here, fully calibrated, we've got 11.8% improvement in uh, diving acceleration and 10% increase in cruise speed. That comes at the cost of manoeuvrability. We'll bring that back up. You see I've lost 3.1% your manoeuvrability there and 3.3% manoeuvrability in turns. The bonus characteristics, perhaps not quite as firmly wedded to these as I was on the gun site, but we have a 1% maximum speed with boost activated, 1% more cruise speed and 1% manoeuvrability in, in turns to try and offset that adverse effect just above. Your alternatives here, 2% acceleration when diving. Well, we've already got 11.8 coming from the piece of equipment, so we're not going to worry about that. 1% yaw maneuverability and 3% acceleration with dummy again. So I've gone for the turning uh, as opposed to the yaw maneuverability here. And then on the engine, we've got both pieces of equipment that can improve your speed. The uprated engine is in place, again, fully calibrated. So 10% acceleration without boost, additional effect, 5.8% extra cruise speed nasty 33% reduction in the resistance to fire. So on the bonus characteristics, I've gone for that 10% improvement in the resistance to fire to offset that nasty 33%, 1% cruise speed and another half percent cruise speed, so 1.5% in total. I could have gone for maximum speed with boost. I decided to emphasize the cruise speed. I want the plane to be generally fast as opposed to fast just under boost. And there's a couple of other uh, characteristics there. Acceleration without boost, not too worried about acceleration. Um, the engine cooldown rate would have liked it, but I think it's much more important to get that resistance to fire and improve the speed. On the boost mixture injection system, again fully calibrated, so we have 10% acceleration with boost activated as a bonus characteristic, uh, as a, a um, extra characteristic, and 5.8% maximum speed with boost activated. And here, boost availability is not down by 20%. Now here I have gone for engine cooldown rate, so I've got 15% across two bonus characteristics to get the boost back as quickly as possible, and I've offset the 20% loss of boost by selecting the bonus characteristic for 5% um, uh, gain in boost. Well, of course you won't gain if you haven't got the adverse effect, but this offsets the adverse effect, so it makes it 15%. And we'll have a look at the figures in the pose build section. Um, and see what we've done to the speed of the aircraft. Additionally, in the post speed section, I will show you a maneuverability build where I've really cranked it up as best I can. Um, there, what I've got in mind is countering P61s at P, um, tier 8. You can do less of that sort of build, a maneuverability build, if you're just worried about countering um, XP54s. But although they are still about, they're not as common as they used to be, and that's less of a focus for me. Let's turn our attention to consumables. Now I mentioned that the fire resistance figure has come down from the 60 that we have as base and here you can see it's now 44. This is getting close to the point where I start to think about mounting either a fire extinguisher or using skill points such as for fire resistance or firefighter on the pilot. 44 is just high enough for me not to do that so I've stuck with my preference, the first aid dressing package and I haven't used skill points uh, for fire resistance or firefighter. You may think differently. 
In the airframe slot, I've gone for more maneuverability for 10 seconds with the pneumatic control assist. And then here I actually have a gold consumable with emergency engine cooling. The difference between this gold consumable and the standard engine cooling is that this one comes back in 60 seconds. You probably don't need that 30 seconds improvement, it's just for my convenience. So I recommend that you mount the standard engine cooling uh, rather than this gold consumable. And then an engine restart bottle, you definitely don't want your engine knocked out, or at least you want the opportunity to repair it once. And then similarly, I'm trying to get rid of gold, so I've I mounted the fragment, fragmentation ammunition here. If you're going to mount gold, this is the one I recommend because that's the one that uh, increases your chance of inflicting critical damage from cannons. However, universal ammunition is fine, and that's what I would recommend that you mount. That. Let's turn our attention to pilot skills. I've opened up the pilot dialog box for the pilot, and you'll see immediately it's a Valkyrie, Charlotte von Stauben. And I think this Valkyrie is a very good pilot to select for this aircraft. And the reason for that is she has two special skills, and one of them, this one, Celestial Fury, has a massive impact on what the guns do. There's a lot of text to read there, but it's the last two lines that are particularly pertinent. This skill will increase the damage caused in a head-on attack by 20%. There are other good effects there, which I'm sure you can read whilst I'm talking. But that's 127 DPS on top of 638. So anything coming head-on is probably going to get at least seriously damaged. And if it's a light fighter, and that's true of either Tier 7 or Tier 8 fighters, you're probably going to melt them unless you're very badly damaged yourself. So if you have this Valkyrie... I would recommend that you put her in it. If you don't have this Valkyrie, let's see what you would do if you were to build a pilot for this aircraft. So, we'll remove the dialog box and we'll put in a fresh pilot. We happen to have one. What would we do here? Well, it's going to depend on your build. I have a speed build, so how I'd approach this is I'd first get aerodynamics expert. Then it's a question of whether you want to improve the acceleration of the aircraft first or the accuracy of the guns. I'd go for accuracy of guns, so I'd go Marksman 1, then I'd build up to Engine Guru 1. Then I'd probably work through, since this is a speed build, cruise flight, you might consider battle tested instead. And then I'd actually head for Engine Guru 2 first over Marksman 2. Repeat and rinse, go through either battle tested or cruise flight, whichever is your preference or other skill if you prefer, and get Marksman two and then on the speed build i'd be heading for cruise flight and way in the future if i had enough skill points i might head for resilience but that would take an awful lot of grinding if you're going to go for a maneuverability build then the approach is slightly different i would suggest and that is that you would still go aerodynamics expert but then you would go for aerobatics expert then head for either marksman one or engine guru one depending on what is your preference Whichever order, get those two. And this time I would probably recommend on a, a maneuverability build, you go for battle tested, drop that, get engine guru two, work back to battle tested, drop it, get marksman two, and then perhaps go back to battle tested and then possibly go up to evasive target a long way in the future. So we're going to discuss the, the effects of my choices in the next section of the video, but I'll also, also show you the effects of a maneuverability build. Here we are back with the workbook, but this time we're looking at the effects of my choices on the base characteristics of the aircraft. So we have the base figures here in column C and D. You've seen those before if you would watched the aircraft statistics section. And then here we've got the build that I did on my press account, which is why up at the top in the header it says PA. So we're not going to discuss this build because we want to talk about this one in columns I and J, which is the build that you've just seen, the speed build on my regular account. And then in K we have the difference um, between the base figures and that build it's expressed in absolute terms. In column L we have the difference expressed in percentage terms. And this build is using the same equipment as the press account, but of course on the regular account I have picked the bonus characteristics I want and I've also fully calibrated the equipment, whereas I didn't do that on the press account. So we're going to have some extra effects. It's going to be a slightly better speed build. We look at the guns, they're still rated at 37. We've got a 20, now got a 20, very nearly 28% increase in accuracy. 
that's the way that the bullets spread out from the muzzle of your machine guns or cannons. That has tightened. In the case of the machine guns, it's tightened down to 0.51 from an original base figure of 0.7. That's all the way over there. In the case of the wing-mounted 30mm, it's come down to 0.47 degrees as opposed to original base figure of 0.65, so that's a healthy improvement. And the hub-mounted cannon is down to 0.4 from an original figure of 0.55. We've also managed to get a slight improvement on the dispersion angles. It's gone up to 4.2, and that's the way um, how far you can be off target before the game corrects your aim for you. It's gone up to 4.2 degrees on the machine guns. Still a very poor 2.1 degrees, but it's better than 2, the original figure for the wing-mounted 30mm uh, cannons, and then up to 3.15 degrees on the uh, hub-mounted cannon. So those are the guns under this build. They're a little bit better than you saw on the press account if you watched my first look video, or indeed you were watching the YouTube stream. Survivability, adverse effects. We've gone down, damage resistance has gone down by one point. And here's the fire resistance figure. I calculate it out at 46.2. It's shown slightly different in the UI. It's just high enough for me to not think about putting on a fire extinguisher or using vital pilot skill points for fire resistance or firefighter um, any lower and i begin to wonder whether i was making the right decision there but as you can see minus 14 quite heavy uh, uh, effect there the airspeed has now gone up to 67 in the previous build on my press account i got it up to a rating of 60 so what's happened here well, now, from an original value of 282 miles an hour for the cruise speed, we've got it up to 360, which is 78 miles an hour faster. This is huge improvement. And we've also got a healthy effect on the, on the uh, maximum speed under boost as well. From an original figure of 441, this is now a pretty rapid 484. And we've done that with an adverse effect on the boost duration of only 1.35 seconds. So we've still got the best part of eight seconds boost here. This aircraft really does shift through the um, air. And I've been able to flee from theoretically fast aircraft uh, pursuing me um, successfully with these figures here, including P-51D Mustangs. Maneuverability, well, the rating's 57, so we've got less adverse effects than we have on the press account, but uh, there's still some nasty ones here. Um, this is not too bad. The turn time is 11.74 seconds, so it's 0 0.04 seconds worse. We have actually managed to increase the roll rate very slightly by three degrees per second, which is going to make absolutely no difference to you. It's pretty much as you were um, for the original maneuverability figures. You're not going to notice a difference here. And on the um, altitude performance, we've got an improvement of a point we've managed to get 501 feet per second climb rate and again this is going to get you away from even things like um, p51 mustangs there are other 51ds there are other other aircraft that will be able to pursue you i've the caustic off 302 if it happens to be flying up towards you you don't want to be uh, trying to do climb away from that you want to turn and face it and out maneuver it and so on and so on so know your aircraft and particularly your tier eights as well which you're going to face a lot Effects on the guns that aren't shown in the UI, we've got a 15% improvement in how quickly they cool down. We've got a 10% increase in the chance of criticals, and we've got a 10% chance um, uh, of fire, which is coming from the equipment that I've mounted. Survivability, because you may have noticed that I've taken off the special camouflage and put on a standard seasonal camouflage, we've got a 20% concealment in boost and a, a resistance to AA gun damage of 10%, that's an improvement, and we also resist uh, damage from rear gunners by 5% uh, more. And we've got a 12% uh, injury resistance uh, adverse effect on the pilot. As far as the airspeed is concerned, we've got 70% acceleration uh, improvement, no boost, and apparently the same, not sure about that figure, but certainly we'll have an improvement of the similar sort. It may very well be 17% for acceleration with boost. The engine will cool down 15% uh, more quickly, and we've got 11.8% acceleration while diving. So the aircraft is just basically going to feel like it's really cutting through the air really nicely for you. Maneuverability, we've lost 1.1% your maneuverability here. And just to, as a reminder, the pilot is the special Valkyrie, Charlotte von Stauben. Some of you 
will recognise that you're going to be fighting a lot of tier eight battles. And unfortunately, this is true of tier seven. It's one of the it's one of the two tiers in the game. The other being tier four, where you regularly get down tiered, and you may be fighting sixty, maybe even seventy percent of your battles. Uh, at tier 8. I had a run um, prior to doing this video where I had nine battles in a row at tier 8 and some of them I did well in and others I was struggling. Uh, if people know how to counter you, if they're flying, flying P-80As, if they're flying P-61s, um, you may very well find that it's quite a difficult battle in which to fight and you're going to be doing it often. And that may lead some of you to think about trying to counter uh, particularly the P-61 there isn't a great deal you can do about a well-built P80, either in terms of speed or manoeuvrability. And you might think about how you could really ramp up the manoeuvrability. And if you're going to do this, I think you're going to have to work really hard at it. And what I've done is I've mounted a gun sight. That's not going to change. Special project lightweight wing frame. And this is on my press account. I wouldn't be able to do this on my regular account. If you haven't got this, you may have an experimental lightweight wing frame. The effects will be similar, although not identical special project lightweight power unit again if you haven't got one of these maybe you've got an experimental one try that and then an uprated engine to try and keep this cruise speed reasonably high let's see what the effects are of this the guns this time i haven't got any improvement to the auto angle uh, and i have got an 18 percent increase in the accuracy of the guns because i haven't this being the press account gone to town with the bonus characteristics, nor have I fully calibrated the gun sight. So just bear that in mind. If you did that, then you'd get figures possibly a little bit more like the ones that um, were on my speed build. So we'll skip over the guns. Adverse effects and survivability. Still seven points, but we've lost 18 hit points because we're using a lightweight wing frame. We're down to 44 damage resistance. Okay, you've lost a couple of points, that's okay. And the fire resistance has come down, but not as much. But bear in mind, I haven't fully calibrated this equipment yet. That is going to come down a bit more uh, at 52. And whether that will get down to below 46, I'm not sure. Probably not. So you'll probably still be all right to mount a first aid dressing kit and avoid using um, skill points for fire resistance and firefighting. Air speed, despite this not being a speed build, we have actually got a little bit of an improvement over the base figures. The rating's gone up to 58 from 55. We've managed to get the cruise speed up to 307. Um, we would be able to do a little bit more if we calibrated the operating engine, so maybe 320 at a guess. Tiny improvement in the boost maximum speed of 444, and we've got our full boost, or wartime emergency power, as it used to be called, of 9 seconds. So something um, positive is better than nothing isn't it the maneuverability is not 70, uh, um, 57 i'll just correct that i happen to know it's 73 and this is getting into the area where you will be able to contest most p61s especially if they're flown by people who don't know how to turn their aircraft. And that's often going to be the case. P-61s are regularly flown by a lot of people who recognise that they're powerful and choose them because it offsets their um, yet-to-be-improved skills at flying their aircraft. So you will probably be able to out uh, most of the P-61s that you're going to encounter with this setup. But look how hard I've had to work. Special project equipment, you'd probably have to use experimental equipment. If you've only got standard equipment, even if you r ramp it up to its absolute maximum in terms of its effect, I think you're probably going to find your maneuverability is around about, I don't know, 67 or so. And that's getting to the point where you're not going to be able to outturn all the P-61s. So I question the value of this approach, but you may want to try it what are the effects well we've managed to reduce the turn time to very nearly 10 seconds for a 360 degree turn and we've improved the roll rate to a rather useful and usable 172 degrees uh, per second no other effects there there will be some effects below which we'll talk about in the moment and i can see what i did now 73 was put in the wrong place that should be 63 and the main effect on altitude performance is that we've now managed to get the climb rate up to 460 as opposed to a, an original base figure of 457. So almost no difference. In fact, that's probably 62. Under this build, what other effects have we got? We've got a 5% criticals chance and a 10% fire chance improvement. We've got 20% fire extinguishing speed, 20% fire damage tolerance. These are important in a speed build, I would suggest. 7% pilot injury resistance as you... Um, uh, 
calibrate the equipment, that will go up to eventually reaching 12%. 11% worse resistance to uh, damage to your engine and indeed 11.5% worse resistance to your uh, damage to your wings and that's penalty of using maneuverability equipment and this will be worse if you use standard equipment uh, these effects are reduced when you use things like experimental and uh, special project equipment airspeed we've got a 9.1% acceleration without boost and a 1.4% improvement in acceleration with boost We've got a massive 21% improvement in your manoeuvrability, and the pilot was still Charlotte von Stauven. Now, this is not a build that I will um, seriously be considering. I'm happy with the speed build. I accept its limitations. I know at tier 8 there are going to be some aircraft with some pilots who I'm not going to be able to counter, and they'll just stop me. But if you build an aircraft just to counter the P-61, or you're pretty much saying that you're giving up on countering other aircraft and you'll find yourself in an awkward position against other planes. And I think that's the wrong kind of focus, but it may be your focus. And therefore, those are the kinds of figures you'll be able to get. And you'll be able to do better than this once you ramp the equipment up to the very highest levels possible and pick the bonus characteristics that you like. Now, I hope you found that helpful. I think it's time under my speed build to see how this aircraft performs in battle. The map for the forthcoming battle is Plateau. It's the Cursed Valley variant, which I think is an attrition variant in a non-attrition mode battle. And what we have are five sectors. Uh, they're laid out roughly in the shape of five spots of a die. And we have two spawn points, um, which we can see here. So sometimes you'll spawn near the command center and sometimes you'll spawn near the garrison. Uh, I much prefer spawning near the command center. Um, don't always get my way, of course. You have a central garrison, which strategically is of little value, but tactically, because it allows easy access to the other sectors, is useful. On one axis, you have the make weight garrisons, one near each spawn for each team. And then you have the strategically sp uh, important command centers on the other axis, again, one near a spawn for each team. And these will release bomber flights that will attempt to flip sectors to your team. Now, how you go about this battle will depend on where you spawn, but roughly what you want to do is try to take your command center and then hold the garrison and hold your local garrison. You will often find that it turns out that, in fact, a team will get one side of the map, so they'll get their local garrison and the enemy's command center, but the other team will do exactly the same, and then it becomes a question of who can get across uh, to their command centre, either from the central garrison or their local spawn point to try and take it back before the enemy takes back their local command centre. So this is a highly variable map and it's quite often the case that it doesn't matter how much strategy you've got in mind, you have to respond to the tactical situation and decide whether you want to try and get the enemy command centre or whether you want to go back and try and retake your own or defend it. If we look at the order of battle, I've deliberately picked a tier 8 battle here. Now, I will say I've had consistently good games in the K-6, but I thought I would show you a battle where the conditions were about as adverse as they could be. You're fighting against enemy tier 8s. And what we have here, on my team, I've got a specialised Spitfire 14 at tier 8, an IL-10M, which is a fairly good ground attacker killer, but not a good ground attacker. It's unspecialised. There's me and my specialised K6, another specialised K6, and then an unspecialised K6. Well, you can see quite a lot of us have been busy over the last few days. The enemy has a powerful specialised RB17. That's bad news. They have a specialised P80A. That's also bad news, particularly good counter to a K6, I can tell you. They have an unspecialised Tempest, so they've got the extra tier 8. And then they've got a K6, a B32, another fairly powerful bomber, and then another bomber, a Junkers 288A. Well, that's not necessarily so bad. Us K6s can probably go after the bombers. However, given they've got so many of them, and they've got a very fast RB17, which is a difficult plane to counter, and they've got that P80A, I think the um, advantage in terms of aircraft looks strongly to be with the enemy team. Let's go and see how the battle panned out. So as the battle starts, 
This is a natively recorded replay file. It's not one of the World of Warplane team's files. Therefore, you'll be able to see me zooming in and out. You'll be see, able to see me looking around. And above all, the reticle will be properly aimed. Might be slightly jerky compared to the World of Warplane's team's uh, replay files. So we spawned nearest the garrison, my uh, less preferred uh, location. But we're going to make the best of it. And we're going to go straight uh, away to that garrison and see if we can get the air defense aircraft. There is an argument for also going for the middle, but I like to give myself a chance of going to the enemy command centre if they haven't um, captured it by the time we've taken this garrison. So we've turned onto one of the A6M2s and I hear it melts. Not really surprising under the uh, effect of my guns. And now we chase down one of the heavies that's come low, look, trying to get the ground attacker. And then we find that another one of the A6M2s is in front of me. We've actually already taken the garrison, but I still managed to shoot that aircraft down despite the fact we caught, got it. Didn't get the capture points, but I got the credit for the kill. Now we're going to the middle. Um, and the reason for that is because they have already captured their command centre. And I can see in the distance what, you, what is almost certainly the PATA. And in fact, as the legend comes up, I can see that it is. I've asked it for it to be focused. I'm focusing it even at this stage. I'm hoping it's going to turn into me does that. I do manage to hit it, but not as hard as I would like. Fortunately, the pilot is very intent on killing the ground, uh, the air defence aircraft and gives me an opportunity, and then does it again. This is criminal. He's not aware that I'm on his tail trying to shoot him down, and he gave me two chances to kill him there, which he could have avoided giving me at all by turning to engage me, and if he had, he probably would have won that engagement. He didn't. We've got him down. We're now chasing a J4M, a air defence heavy, hitting it hard with the guns. And those things can be hard to hit, so we're doing pretty well to take that down as quickly. The enemy has three sectors, and we have none because they've already captured the garrison that we took originally. Like the Fokker Wolf, and unusually the Fokker Wolf doesn't go for the ram because it's being hit so hard by the guns. I decide to fly straight on and leave that for the planes behind me. They've already killed it. I'm going to go and try and take um, a garrison because I happen to be pointing that way. And I noticed it's only defended by ADA, so provided I don't fly into the J4Ms, which I'm avoiding now, I should be able to do a job here and try and get my team back into this battle. Now we've finally ca captured our command centre. I'm going to work over the J4M A defence heavy. Good shots here, and it goes down quickly. And if you've got a low DPS aircraft, you'll know how hard it can be to take these aircraft down, because their hitboxes seem to be quite small. One more aircraft will get this garrison, and now we need to think about capturing other sectors. So the enemy has made a strong start, and I can't say I was too surprised. Given their order of battle, I thought that in terms of planes, they had the advantage. So it's no surprise to me that they went 3-0 up, and now we've only just got to the stage where it's 3-2. Again, the disadvantage they've got on their team, of course, is that they've got three bombers, which means they can't do an awful lot of defending. So capturing sectors shouldn't be our problem. Keeping sectors, quite different. Back on a J4M. Melt that. A6M2 comes into sight. Certainly melt that as well. And now we just need one more. And another A6M2 obligingly flies towards us destroy that and now we've got three sectors. Moving on, I don't think there's much point in trying to defend. Let's go and try and take the garrison in front of us. But the J4M heavies are low. Means I've got to watch out for the A6M2s in case they latch onto me. I could have shot one of them then, but I decided to stay on the J4M it's quite a few of the initial shots. Now beginning to pass them in. Just. And the Akamatsu medal goes through already. I've been busy in terms of capturing sectors. Focus the other J4M. Big hits on it there. It's got no engine. Should be easy to hunt down now. And that flips the sector. Take a few cheeky shots at the A6M2 that was still alive as I turn back towards the centre. And now my team have turned it right round because we've captured their command centre and we are five sectors to nil up, which will pull us back into this game very nicely. See the ground attackers? One of them is, in fact, they're not ground attackers. They're both bombers. 
decided to go for the one that's slightly higher in altitude because I know I can do knock it down more quickly and that gives us the best chance of saving this sector. And now I'm going to go for the one that's flying extremely low and this is an RB17 and with this speed build maybe he's out of boost but I'm chasing him down. I think with the maneuverability build I might not have been able to do this and down he goes under the weight of those guns. So they failed to take that sector. I'm pleased that I've saved it. Assess my options, as you can see, lots of looking at the tab to see what's going on, what I should do, what I need to do, and try and get uh, as many chevrons as possible. I've already got four. Also don't want the game necessarily to end too quickly, so there is an argument that perhaps it's worth letting them continue to have that sector. Always slightly a dangerous thing to do. But we get presented with a ground attacker. And even though that's a relatively high hit point aircraft, it disappears under the power of these guns. They are really good at knocking down things like ground attackers, bombers and heavies. Using the good climb speed to get up to the Fokker Wolf. It decides to dive. It's often difficult to keep on target in that situation. Then I get it into a spiral of death. We kill that. Now it's three sectors to two, so and we're about to lose another sector, so you're beginning to wonder whether I should have actually gone and taken that other, other gas. And Bomber comes in, waves his wings at me, so I decide to avoid. I swing round. I probably shouldn't have turned. Makes it an easy kill for me. I see more uh, aircraft coming in. We've taken back a sector, so I don't feel under pressure to go and take anything else. I decide to go down rather than up. Another ground attacker. I think it probably flew into the cliff. Um, since I shot it last, I get presented with a kill, and that's the hero of the sky badge. Smash the Tempest as he comes towards me. Decide to turn because it's a bot. Just about make it, even with the speed build. Kill him. Unfortunately, he takes my engine out, and I put my consumable straight in. And at this point I turn and find I've been jumped by the PATA, and there is nothing I can do about it. And he shoots me down. And that is the end of this game. For me. And there we have it. 14,000, very nearly 15,000 personal points, and a whole slew of medals there. This was an effective game, and bear in mind, this was at tier 8, so it can be done. That brings me to the end of my review of the Messerschmitt BF 109K-6 Kurfürst, and this aircraft has mighty DPS, but is less manoeuvrable than the other BF 109s in the game, and for that reason I prefer to build it as a true boom and zoom aircraft. If you're concerned about opponents such as the P-61 Black Widow and want to put a manoeuvrability build on this uh, plane, you're going to have to work hard, and I think you're going to need at least experimental air equipment to make it viable. Well, I hope you found that helpful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. Stick around, there's a bonus battle, an ace, that's unnarrated, so I'm going to leave you here. This is the Noble Q, signing out. <laughs>